Right. Wrestling fans, I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm Tony, Mr. USA Atlas. How y'all doing out there? Before we get to the news, some topics of discussion, check out some offers from our great friends. We'll be right back. Are you part of a nonprofit organization, a youth group looking to raise cash for your cause? Stay tuned at the end of this video to learn how you can bring the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation to your town live, featuring the superstars and legends of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Have you ever thought about just how much time it takes to plan every detail of your wedding day? Many brides are now spending 10 to 15 hours each week planning the perfect day. It's like adding a part-time job to your already busy life. Not everyone can afford to hire a full-time wedding planner to help with every detail, which is why so many brides are now turning to a wedding day coordinator. That's right, a wedding day coordinator saves you money, and more importantly, it gives you the peace of mind that your special day will run smoothly. From finalizing all of the details you've worked so hard on to coordinating with vendors, KL Wedding Coordinators will be there every step of the way to guide you through the day and allow you to savor the memories that'll last a lifetime. For more information, visit facebook.com backslash KL Wedding Coordinators or give them a call, 603-320-2752. You think you know your favorite superstar? Did you know about Sasha's favorite cousin? What about AJ's tattoos? Chris Jericho's expensive taste? No. You need the book that has everything you want to know about more than 200 of your favorite WWE superstars. It's the WWE Ultimate Superstar Guide. Wrestling fans around New England, WWE superstar The Boogeyman is coming to the bullpen. 59 Hanover Street in Lebanon, New Hampshire, Sunday afternoon, August the 26th, for an interactive meet and greet, autographs and pose photos. Visit thebullpennh.com to take advantage of this rare opportunity to meet the man from the bottomless pit. Lebanon, The Boogeyman is coming to get you live. I think WrestleMania 1 is what got Vince McMahon started. That's it. The buildup of that, everything about it, the timing, everything worked together. You know, even their enemies, uh, Ted Turner, were helping us because every other word they would say something about WW, you know, F. I mean, yeah, the thing you do is don't say nothing about your enemy. Right. They didn't. <laughs> so they made us even better. Yep. They cut their own throat. No, I don't think whatever her name is, Cindy Lauper, and all those people in that, all it did is give it a, that little glitter, but did it help? They come out there to see a show, buddy, and they got it. Lawrence on Sunday, August 12th. WWE returns live with a massive main event. Witness AJ Styles collide with Shinsuke Nakamura for the WWE Championship in a notice qualification match. Also, don't miss a fatal four-way as Jeff Hardy battles Rusev, The Miz, and Samoa Joe for the United States Championship. Plus, see The New Day, Carmella, and many more. It's the WWE Live SummerSlam Heatwave Tour in Florence, Sunday, August 12th. Tickets and VIP packages are available. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans from around the corner, around the world. Around Welcome the world. To another special installment of Wrestling Insiders. John Cena Sr. and his piece are on assignment. Maybe the toque glue's coming a little loose due the to the who? summer heat. The toque glue. What in the world is that? You know, that raccoon on the top of his head. Oh, I ain't gonna talk about that. WWE is live tonight in Jacksonville, Florida. It's Monday Night Raw. Tony, as the countdown to SummerSlam is on for them, it also means the countdown is on for us. Our regular full-length Memories and Legends episode because it's SummerSlam weekend and they have NXT TakeOver, we're not just going to have one episode for them, Tony. We're going to have two great 
full-length memories and legends episodes when WWE takes over Brooklyn, we'll take over the internet. One episode, we focus on three of the great WWF champions and WWF champions with Bruno San Martino, superstar Billy Graham and Bob Backlund. And then we have one of the most uh, interesting and unique episodes we've ever produced where we're joined by MWF president, Dr. David Reese. Oh, yeah. We try and break down the psyche. The man that loves the shoes. A little abuse. A little abuse. Mr. USA Tony Alice. This one, there's some wrestling stories involved. It's a fun episode, but it's very unique having an acclaimed psychiatrist, what he does outside of wrestling. He is, he works with many uh, major league sports teams, uh, hospitals. He's a renowned uh, in his field. And to have David Reese here, he's a man of great respect. He's going to tell y'all what's going on up in here. All right, Tony. Up here, they're going to tell you. We something. might have to turn this into a mini series if that's the case. Oh, boy. Right. Tony, the response to our episode about you witnessing the murder of Bruiser Brody, it was a sad episode, but it was very insightful. I'm glad we produced it. Fans can learn from that for decades to come. What, what Bruiser Brody uh, taught me, I was riding in 1974. I was in a car with a gentleman by the name of Klondike Bill. He was from uh, Canada. And he said, kid, when you finish this business, if you have one friend, consider yourself lucky. For years, rest of the family said, oh, ain't all you guys friends. Well, I always thought of that until the deaf abuser broke it. And I found out that wrestlers, some are friends. I ain't going to say that there ain't no friends among wrestlers, but they slim and none. It, it, you very rarely you're going to find two wrestlers really friends. Mostly, we are business association. You, they friend, while you're in the territory, working with them and making each other money and making each other look in the ring, you, they friend. But once you get in trouble or you no longer here, when I became homeless, I knew more millionaires than, than, than the Rockefeller and I couldn't bum a quarter. When Brody got stabbed to death in the locker room, he couldn't find anybody to come to his assistant. Hell, he couldn't even find anybody to come down to the police station to report what happened. They all say they didn't see nothing. So wrestling have been what you call, it's an individual sport. Everybody there is self-employed. So John Cena worked for John Cena. Tony Atlas worked for Tony Atlas. Hulk Hogan worked for Hulk Hogan. You know, and what we have, we small corporation that come together to form, the, to, uh, to form one organization. But, but on the, all the WWE guys, they all what you call self-employed. When we do our taxes, uh, 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 we we fill out of, uh, of do taxes every every quarter because we we consider it as self-employed. So every wrestler, as Mad Dog for Sean would say, wrestling is a dog eat dog business, and you have to get your bite out of it. All right, Tony. There has been some interesting feedback from the fans. We love to engage with the fans. That's what makes Memories and Legends a lot of fun. Uh, one question, Tony, and this one confused me, and then we texted about it and even spoke about it on the phone. Uh, Nature Boy Ric Flair did some interviews, including Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast, where he said he was in Puerto Rico the night of the murder. No, Flair was not. He was nowhere near Puerto Rico in 1988 uh, uh, because Brody was the main event. If Flair were there, believe me, you, everybody would have known Ric Flair were there because Ric Flair never went anywhere without the whole town knowing about it. He was nowhere near that. NWA was having the Great American Bash Tour the same week, so R Ric Flair was not in he Puerto Rico. He was not in Puerto Rico during that time, no. It's interesting. Sometimes wrestlers, they hear stories secondhand, and they almost start to feel like they've heard it so many times. Well, he's getting they up were there. there. What, 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 do I think what it is is that uh, he's, it's not all there anymore. You think nature's slipping a little? Yeah, really? yeah, we all, when you get older, sometimes you say things and do things. And, you know, the Flair had, had a lot of uh, abuse to his body and to his brain That's cell. For sure. Yeah, you got to think of all the drinking and partying. And everything, got, everything got his toe. You know, back in my drug days, you know, the, my memory is not that good anymore because I got involved with drugs uh, uh, real bad. I, I'm not proud of it. I'm clean as a whistle now, but... There, there was a time where it's a lot of stuff that I lost that I didn't get back for my drinking and potting uh, days. And here's a guy that never stopped potting. So I, I think he's getting his uh, uh, 
Uh, he's getting his thing mixed up there a little bit. Well, to think you were at the scene of a murder that took place, that's quite a, he was a, not a jump. <laughs> no, no, no. He, he, he was not nowhere near near that uh, place because world class, work, uh, world class wrestling was working with Puerto Rico at that time. So unless you were working for world class wrestling, you was not in, t in Puerto Rico because they was partners, uh, the Von Erichs and uh, them, just like uh, the Funks was the guy that was get everybody hooked up for Japan. Right. So Flair was too big for Puerto Rico during that time. Hulk Hogan, I think, wrestled there maybe once. Flair maybe wrestled there maybe twice. They were too big for it. They, they were for guys along my level would go to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico couldn't afford Ric Flair price. They couldn't pay his price. So I, I'd say Ric Flair probably went there in his earlier days. But I doubt very seriously. They, I, I don't remember. I went in and out for many. I never. I went in and out of Puerto Rico for four years. I right. never seen Flair there in four years. Well, I just I found it unusual that, you know, it, it it's not a secret that he was defending the NWA title and wrestling in war games matches during the Great American Bash Tour. So he definitely would not have been in Puerto Rico. He wasn't in Puerto Rico the night Bruiser Brody got murdered. Not I with just, the money that Flair made because Flair during his time was getting eight percent of the gate. Wow. So so if you had a hundred thousand dollar house, you know eight grand uh, baby. Eight grand went it's into a good night. Went, went into Flair. And you're pocket. talking eighties money. Right. And so <laughs> there's no way in the world that Carlos Galone could give him eight percent or ten percent of yeah. the gate. And Flair was making big money there. He wouldn't go to that little Allen for nothing. Not even for a vacation. Tony, one uh thought that was put out there and I'd never heard this before, but maybe you can state true, false, or maybe you don't even know yourself. Uh, the invader, Jose Gonzalez, that murdered Bruiser Brody, is it true that at the time, right around the time this murder took place, he was building a new home, uh, and his young son drowned in a swimming pool? That's true. That is true. That's true. Now, how long of a period? And then the same day, the same day of the murder, he was backing out of his driveway and ran over his daughter on a bicycle. He didn't kill her or nothing, but 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 she got hit. Uh, he hit her with the car the same day of the murder. So with the, within the same I, mm -hmm. uh, maybe couple of weeks, he's building a new home. Mm -hmm. His young son drowns in a swimming pool. That's right. And then the day he stabbed Bruiser Brody mm -hmm. to death, he ran over his daughter on a bicycle. Right. Really. Yeah. So he was all messed up in the head. Do you think? And Tony, you know the man invader. People have read about him, they've read about the murder, they've made their own judgments. You've known the man. Were you surprised? I mean, we... He I was wanna... my friend. And Jose Gonzalez Jose, was your friend. Jose Gonzalez and me, we was friends for many, many, many years. You know, and I told Carlos uh, the same night of the stabbing. I said, I don't know how to, to stand on this. I said, Brody's my friend, Jose's my friend. Jose never did nothing. In fact, Jose went out of his way to help me when I went to Puerto Rico. Really? Yeah, he was the booker there. He he took real good care of me. He was, you know, one of the best people, one of the best people I know. So that's why everybody was. Uh, I was so surprised because I didn't know whose side to take. But I didn't. You know, I helped Brody. Right. You know, well, you because Brody, I had, had to. to. Brody was hurt, but I felt so bad that a friend did it. I mean, somebody I could sell as a friend. Me and Jose, we worked out together in the gym, and then we traveled together and everything. I had absolutely no animosity towards that man at all. And what brought on the, the, the stand between him and uh, Brody, to be absolutely honest with you, the only person really know what was the cause of it is Jose. And maybe one day you could get him on the phone or talk to him and find out his reason for it. But that, like Carlos told me that night, that between them two, it got nothing to do with the rest of us. And he asked me how I felt about Jose. And I said, he's my friend. I said, they're both, both people are my friend. So, 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 so what am I going to do? It had to be premeditated, though. He snuck the oh, it was premeditated. knife it wasn't no into the locker room with Yes, him. he did. It wasn't like they just got into a fist fight no, and he knocked was, his head off the wall. No, there was not even an argument. There was right. nothing, absolutely nothing. I was drawing a picture of, of, of Mark and Jay Youngblood, Rick Romero's son, and Brody came over, and he said, wow, I didn't know you could do that. He said... That looked just like them. He said, can you do a picture? Because we still had about three or four more days left on the tour. Mm -hmm. So he said, can, can you do a picture of my son? I said, yeah, if you give me one. I said, I'll be finished with this in about five or ten minutes. I just wanted to get the eyes because the picture they gave me, I couldn't see the, the eyes that good. You know, mm -hmm. because back in the olden days when you take pictures of wrestlers, it was a head-to-toe shot. 
Right. All the pictures were from head to toe. Now all the pictures are from the waist up. Right. When you look at the old ones, it's all the way from head full to toe. Full body, yep. That's the full body shot. So, so this was a full body shot, so, but I couldn't get the, the eyes the way, the, to look like their eye. So I told them to stand in front of me so I could draw their eyes to, to fit it. I told Bro, I said, in about 15 minutes, I'll be finished with this one, and I can get started on it now. And before you leave, I had your son picture. That when Jose walked up behind him and said, uh, Brody, can I talk to you, please? And Brody go, sure. Both Jose sound real nice, Brody sound real, real nice. And Brody had his pouch in one hand, had a picture of his son in the other hand like this, and he turned, put one foot through the shower door, I reached down to do something on, on my art pad, and I hear, Whoa! I go, what? I looked up, and I hear it again. Whoa! This time, Brody bent over, and when he bent over, I saw the knife goes in the air like this, and I sprung from my seat, wrapped my arm around Brody's waist, and yanked him back. When I'm yanking back, the knife came down to cut his ponytail off as I was pulling him back. Brody's ponytail? Yeah, got cut off. Yeah, the knife you know, came down and cut his ponytail off. I, I hope this question doesn't come off in poor taste, Tony, but how, how many times was he stabbed? Twice. Twice. And an attempted and two, third? Eight, but he wasn't just stabbed. He... he there was eight inch cuts. Wow. Eight inches. So he hit him and ran across. Wow. Hit him and ran across. Because when I grab him and to pull him back, I have to take this hand and pull his intestine off my arm and stick it back in his stomach his for His intestines him. came out on yeah, around. Yeah, it was wow. on my arm. Because I yanked them real fast, so the intestine sure, came sure. out and, and was wrapped around my arm. So to get this arm out, I have to take this arm and peel this intestine off, and then I push him back in his, in his stomach. And I took his hand and put it on top of his intestine. And he looked at me and said, brother, he said, I'm hurt. Don't let, don't let them hurt me anymore. Not him. Them. Them. So do, was there anything that went on that you think you didn't see? I, nobody knows what Jose exactly what happened. Was Carlos Colon he, there? He was there. In fact, Carlos Colon, Victor Jerica, and Jose was sitting in a football huddle. See, Jose was supposed to pick Brody up at the Tanama Hotel. When I came out the door, I was running late because I was waiting for the, the, uh, the owner of the bodybuilding gym to close the gym because I told him I would take him to the wrestling match. And I went and asked Carlo, I said, Carlo, is okay, I bring the, the owner. And we all worked out in the same gym called the, the, the Muscle Factory. Mm -hmm. And all the wrestlers went there for free. They didn't charge us. So I went to do something for him. I said, why don't you come and watch me wrestle? He said, oh, I would love to. He said, but where can I get tickets? I said, if you go with me, you don't have to pay. I said, I can get you in free. He goes, yeah, but you have to wait for me to, uh, to uh, close, close the gym. Up. So I said, okay. So then I called Carlos, so I'm going to be a little bit late because uh, I bring in the, the guy from the Monster Factory. Uh, Carlos said, oh, that's great, Tony. He said, no, no problem. He said, no problem at all. So as I come out the door, the guy finally pulled up, and as I was coming out, he was pulling up. And I said, Brody, uh, who you waiting on? I said, I, you know, why are you still here? You know, because I'm running late. So why, he's the main event. So why are you still here? He said, I'm waiting for Jose. Hmm. So he was waiting on Jose at the hotel. So when we walked through the door, Carlos, Jose, and uh, Victor Enrique were sitting in the football huddle. And I thought it was kind of strange. He waited for Jose. Jose's at the building. Yeah. Why are you waiting? To, uh, Do you think they wanted to make it look like he no-showed the event, or? Uh, Why would it's you? It's hard to say. He, Brody had to have been in the main event or semi-main event. He was event. the main event. Why would you strand the guy at the Abdul hotel? He was against Abdul the Butcher that yeah. night. It was a big blood match, and people loved it. You know. Oh yeah. Guy. And that was going to be a Rico crazy match. For, I mean, right? Bruiser Brody versus Abdul the Butcher was probably at that time was like watching Brock Lexter and John Cena. Right. I mean, it was a big, big, big event. Those uh, are some vivid memories right, I have right, from a little kid a when big, I started watching that, wrestling. That, that was a big deal with Abdullah. So well, let me ask you this, Tony. I you never understood a, that. You put a thought in my head. Well, you were friends with Jose Gonzalez. Very good. Why do you think in the aftermath, after you witnessed the murder, uh, Juan Rivera, TNT, probably best known to fans in the U.S. as Savio Vega, why did he try and tell you to get off the island because immediately? Because I, I was talking. See, when I Do you came think back, you were in legitimate danger? 
Yes, yeah, he well, he knew I was. He, he knew Why I was. Why is that? Because it, he spoke Spanish, I didn't, and he hear what they okay. were saying. Okay, so in the he could hear room. what was going on. Right, right. Oh, okay, and, and I got when they you. talked, they talked in Spanish, and most of us America you. didn't understand Spanish. But but yeah, he, yeah, he because see what happened was, the Brody thing would have got swept under the rug except for one person opened their mouth, you. and that one person <laughs> was me. When well, I, I shouldn't laugh, back, but when I got back from the hospital, a police but said say uh. I was going to come by to see you later. He said, I was trying to find out what hospital it is so I could talk to you. And I said, well, I'm here now. What do you want to talk about? He said, did you get a, a look at the wrestling fan that stabbed Brody? I said, there was no fan that did it. He said, w it wasn't? He said, well, who? I said, that MF right there. But I was mad at Jose for doing that, you know. I said, he did it. He said, they call him the Vader, Invader. Invader, yeah. He said, you mean Vader? He didn't call him Invader. He said, Vader. You mean Vader? I said, yes, him. And he said, that's strange. He said, every wrestler in this dress room told me that Brody got stabbed by a fan. Wow. So the story was already made up for the police. While I was at the hospital, they had sat down, had a meeting to come up with what they're going to tell the police when it's almost police like booking up. a storyline. Do and you I think I came there and blew the lid off of everything? Do you think that Savio Vega may have saved you by trying to push you to well, leave? I know he did. Really? I know he did. Every time I see him, I said, this is the guy that saved my life. I'd love to have Savio on because the show. Because I, I would have went up to my room. And God and only said, knows what could have happened. Well, he said they're waiting for you. Really? And have you seen earlier pictures of me? They weren't going to come at me with no knife. They want to shoot me. Yeah. There would have been they no knife. To, yeah. Because the, I would have been too aware of it. And I would have. You had to have been ex worried that something was going to happen. You would have been on your toes. Brody wasn't expected to be stabbed in the middle of the locker exactly. room. Exactly. Right. That was a, he, had a, he had a picture of his son in one hand and his wrestling bag in the other. And when they took him to the hospital, he had a picture of his son in his hand. When they took him into the operation room, he had that picture of his son in his hand. Well, you know, when he passed away, he never let go of that picture. The doctor told me he died holding on to that picture of his son because he knew he would never see his son and family again. I only hope that that brought him a little, tiny, minuscule bit of comfort, at least to know that he had his little guy, a picture of him in his hand. That what did it. As he was taking his he last breaths. He would not breaths. let that picture go. Wow. He, would, he would not let that picture go. I, I remember at the hospital, he's laying there holding his, holding his intestines in with one hand and holding his son's picture just like this. He would not let that picture go for nothing. And when I saw him when they pushed him into the emergency room, he still holding that picture right there. He was hoping that he'd get to see his boy again. Wrestling fans. Now, all he wanted to do is get home and see his family. That's all that man wanted to do. Is get, he thought about nothing but his family his last few days. On, and his, on his wife trip. is a very nice lady. I've met her at the Cauliflower yeah. Alley Club reunions in yeah. Las Vegas. Uh, I don't, the, the, the fans that maybe because Bruiser Brody wasn't, he didn't have a big run in WWF with Hogan, uh, you don't know what you missed out on. I, I'm sure at some point Brody would have had that they WWF cheated the world run. Out of, they cheated the world out of something special. And, a man, and I'm sure there's as time went on. There would never been anything like him say. Never. He would have been a phenomenon in ECW. Yeah. And I'm sure being the very smart man that he was, he would have figured out how to get a nice payday during the Monday Night Wars when Raw and Nitro were going head to head. And well, another thing people didn't know about Brody, who was a veteran. Yes, yep. He served, he served, he served, served, served out on false. He went and fought for this country. All right, he Tony. put his life on the land for this country. An American hero. And he was an American hero. Yeah. Well, Tony, I'm going to share a thought with you. We had one of, a man you have a lot of respect for in this very studio, eight-time world champion Harley Race. I'm going to share with you his thought on this. I have to read it off of the sheet of paper. Uh, Harley said, Brody was a type of person that brought stuff to him. Surprised me that he survived over there as long as he did. When you're a bully and you enjoy bullying, at some point you're going to run up against something that ain't going to want to be bullied. And that particular one had a big knife. Any reaction to thought to Holly's comments? All wrestlers in my day was bullies. We have to make ourselves bigger than life. When I first got into the wrestling ring, George Scott, I could see him hollering at me now, kid, learn to take care of yourself in that ring. You see, even though people know that wrestling is stage, when I first started, 
the only thing in a wrestling match, the only thing that was staged in a wrestling match in the 70s was who going to win and who going to lose. What went on that first 10 minutes was totally up to you up to and you. the wrestler. Yep. You go watch a couple of tapes of me where I didn't want to go along with the program. And you could tell. I one tape on YouTube I saw with me and Paul Ondoff. And I didn't want to sell for Paul. And there was nothing Paul Ondoff could do about it. Nothing. I wrestled Randy Savage. And I didn't want to sell for him. There was nothing Randy Savage could do about it. That I had old time wrestlers that didn't want to sell for me, and there was nothing I could do about it. Because there was a lot of wrestlers in the olden days that could have mopped up the floor with me. They'd hook you. Oh, they hook you, they tell you. But uh, I became a big bully in the nannies. Because in the nannies, they stopped uh, hiring, they got rid of all them tough guys. Yeah. You know, the real tough guy. Tell you who was a tough guy, never won a match. Harlot, and that was a guy called Johnny Raj. The unpredictable one. If you can, Johnny Raj, you would have to fight for your life with Johnny. Johnny wouldn't give you nothing. Really? Johnny wouldn't last one day with Vince now because <laughs> Vince would want Johnny to make the other guy look, look good. good. Yeah. If John Cena, as big and strong and tough as John Cena, got in the ring with, with uh, 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 Johnny Raj, he would be fighting for his life. Every inch, Johnny Rod would come at you and come at you and come at you and come at you and come at you. He would not slow up. You watch some old tapes of Johnny Rod. He would eat you up in the ring nonstop. It was like, he was like, be, wrestling Johnny Rod was like being attacked by a, a, a pit bull. When Linquish would not stop for nothing. Just always coming, 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 coming. Now, when you got in the ring with Johnny Rod, you had to fight for your life. And there was a lot of other guys like that, too. Like, we watched the, the match of me and Huck Hogan. Huck Hogan never took a regular slam, never been off of his feet. Never took you a... You pressed him. Pressed and him. And if you look at his hand, his right hand, he reached for my trunk first. He missed him. Because I used to wear them little... Uh, small tights. Small, yeah. uh, tight, like bodybuilding type trunk. Yeah. So he reached for my trunk, he missed. Now he... And I got baby all on, so he couldn't grab nothing. But you could see his hand trying to grab something. And then when you look at his face in any photograph, you're like, he could not believe that he, that somebody could put, could get him up. Well, he was 340 pounds. And mostly 300 pounders in my day didn't take bumps. They didn't go off their feet. He went off his feet. Yeah. The same thing with King Kong Bundy. When I used to, to slam King Kong Bundy, he kind of stood there like, go ahead if you can. You know, if you, ever show, if you ever see the tape, he held his hands out like this, like, go ahead if you can. And I got him up, and his face, he got, and I looked at the picture of me pressing Jesse Ventura, and I looked at the picture of me pressing Ric Flair, and I looked at the picture of me pressing Huck Hogan. And what is so amazing about all three pictures, they all got the same expression on their face. All right, well, Tony. They were shocked, that, because they'd never been up there before. And nobody wanted to take that bump during that time. That was the biggest bump in the business. Sure was. Because I'm 6'2", so when I lift a person up here, that person was falling seven feet out there. Right. That's a big this bump. Before, That's yeah. a big Today, bump. Today, it's not. Because now you got guys taking bumps off a 10-foot cage. I just look up, broke that, broke my press lamp when he jumped off the 10-foot slave. The and then yeah. Mankind came along and broke that. And then Shane McMahon came along and broke what Mankind did. When they did the elbow off the, off top, the top of the yep. cage, on the, not in the ring like Mankind did, on the concrete floor. Well, he had a table. The, the, still, the bottom, the, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it came to a, a stop, it was on the concrete floor. Well, that, uh, that was a fan of Tony, uh, you know, I can't believe, this is a Bruiser Brody video, and we're going into Hell in the Cell matches. The Shane McMahon table was all gimmicked up. Mick Foley's wasn't. He landed on the announcers. Mick Foley. Mick Foley in Hell in the Cell back in June of 98. Look that butt. When Undertaker flew, flung him off the top of the cell, he hit the table yeah. and went, almost slid under the guardrail into the crowd. What? Shane McMahon's, it was a great feat, but it was much more a safe for him. I don't see anything being safe. All right, you know what? <laughs> as safe as jumping off the top of a cell onto a table could be. They took some precautions that Mick Foley didn't have in place, I guess is the best but, way to put hey, it. 
It would have been. It butter. takes balls either way. How about that? Hey, to me, it would be better if they didn't give me the table because at least that would have slowed him down. So if the table gave me, that means between him and that top and that concrete float, there was nothing to slow him down. All right, Tony. We, again, we go off the rails. That's what makes these videos so much fun. Well, he hit the concrete floor. Right, the right, floor concrete. Right. He hit the floor concrete. You win. With no mattress on there. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 there's no mattress. No, no. Nothing. All right, Tony, Tony, please. Running out of time here again. I hope you guys enjoy Monday Night Raw tonight. The countdown is on for WWE for SummerSlam weekend. And for us, again, SummerSlam weekend is going to be a lot of fun, Tony. It's going to be a great weekend. Not one, but two full length Memories and Legends episodes. One, we talk about Bruno San Martino, superstar Billy Graham, and Bob Backlund. Then another episode where we have a renowned psychiatrist, the MWF president, Dr. David Reese, joins us to try and break down the psyche of this guy. Again, check out bostonwrestling.com. Follow us on Twitter. Support our endeavors. Come down to the studio next time Tony's here and some of the great legends we have planning this fall. DVDs galore. We lost our good friend Vader. We have a special where you get the DVD and an autograph photo from him. For the Hall of Famer, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, I'm Dan Marotti. We'll see you SummerSlam weekend. pick a -boo. I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm John Cena Sr. Let us tell you how the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation can help raise cash for your nonprofit cause. Experience the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation live in your city throughout New England, the tri-state area, down through the Carolinas, out to our friends in the Midwest and beyond. If your nonprofit organization is looking for an interactive turnkey experience while putting the fun into fundraising, you've met the perfect tag team partner to work with every step of the way. The MWF offers a variety of packages for groups of almost any size, from our live events at the Boston Garden, the Kowloon Entertainment Dining Complex, and the legendary Suffolk Downs, to high school gyms and function halls. We've presented live events everywhere and anywhere. Since 2001, the MWF mission has been simple. Keep the kids off the streets. Under the leadership of President David Reese, we bring the superstars of yesterday, today and tomorrow, to your town. Not for a wrestling show, but an event that features action-packed in-ring wrestling, autograph, pose photo opportunities, Q&A sessions, and so much more. It's the best of sports and entertainment. The week of your event, we can add on to the endeavor with anti-bullying campaigns, library meet and greet reads, youth sport concussion seminars, and more. Our live events are fit for fans of any age from 5 to 95. This fall is part of our new Kids Club program. We offer live event experiences exclusively for the youngest of fans. On the flip side, we can produce a tailor-made event for fans of an older demographic as well. We work with you every step of the way to get the word out to fans near and far on our local television offerings and to over 50,000 fans and growing on our social media platforms. Your success is our success. If your group has had enough of candy bar and wrapping paper sales and has the energy to team with our passionate fan base, bringing the NWF experience to your community is the answer to put smiles on faces while raising cash for your cause. Contact us today to get the ball rolling for your custom-made event that you'll want to bring back year after year to your community. Don't just take it from us. Here are the folks we've teamed up with in the past.